Hey, g'day, it's Presso, and I hope you're doing well as we go into this holiday season for 2023. Now, I am starting on a new project today, and it is a clock, and I know I've done clocks before, but this one is specifically for the workshop. Now, one of the great things about being retired is that you don't have to meet deadlines very often. But every now and then there'll be an appointment or someplace we have to be at a certain time, and my wife will issue a deadline and I try as hard as I can to stick to that, but at the end of the day, I love deadlines. I love the sound as they go whooshing past. But yes, I do need a clock in the workshop, so let's have a look at what I have in mind. Now this is the clock that I used to use down here in the workshop. This was up on the wall, and it's one of those promotional things that was given away by a supplier that I used to work with when I was teaching. And it worked great when I first got it. Uh, the battery lasted about six months, and I replaced it when it went dead. And then the next battery only lasted about two months and then I found that half the time it was just sitting there dead on the wall because I couldn't be bothered putting new batteries in it all the time. Now, I put a new battery in it just now and it's decided to work, but I think it's time for it to go. Now, I don't know if you can see it, but there's some corrosion appearing on it now and I hate that, so I think we're gonna give this one the flick. Now, to replace it, I want to make a clock using the Colchester Lathe logo. Now, I own a Colchester Mark 1.5 student lathe, and this is the logo that Colchester used to use on their machinery. Now, I made this one as a sample just to see if I could do it. The original one that I made was uh, acid etched brass, and that is actually on the lathe. And uh, I saw a post on Instagram by a gentleman called I Am Tim the Farmer. Now, he had made a clock using the Colchester logo, but he 3D printed it, and I think he hand-painted all of the detail on it. But as soon as I saw it, I thought, yeah, that's absolutely what I need down here in the workshop. So this one was just a trial run to see if I could get the process right, and we're going to make a much bigger version of this, roughly three times larger than that. So the clock movement that I'll be using is this one here. Now this is called a high torque quartz movement. It's uh, specially designed to take these much bigger hands and it's called a Euro shaft style clock. And in this style here, the actual minute hand is held on with a, a nut and it's got a positive, uh, like, a, uh, like a slotted attachment over the end of the minute shaft. So I think this one will do the job. Uh, I'll probably, I may, <laughs> Uh, shorten this minute hand. It's sort of a bit bigger than what I really wanted. Now the material I'm going to be working with is this stock here. Now this is uh, three millimeter thick or maybe three and a half millimeter thick aluminium. It's got a coating on it which is why it's that unusual bronze color. Now it came out of a skip and it's sort of badly scratched so I'm going to have to sort of uh, clean that surface up. And I'm going to do this uh, by powder coating this sheet and then we're going to laser etch the detail into the surface of the powder coated disc. Now you cannot uh, actually etch into aluminium with a CO2 laser, which is what I have, but you can burn off the powder coat, selectively burn it off. And then we're going to chemically etch the surface of the aluminium to give it a uniform finish, and then we'll put a clear coat over it. Now I need to tell you this project is going to push the limits of all of the equipment that I have to do this job. It just fits in my CO2 laser. It only just fits onto the face plate of my lathe and it sort of barely fits into the powder coating oven. But I've checked all of those things and I think it's doable. So we'll go next door and get this ready now and we'll get some powder coat on it. Because this is a second hand piece of aluminium sheet, it's got some deep scratch marks on it and sort of gouges and damage. And although the powder coat will cover up minor scratches, if there's a deep mark there, it'll just flow into that. So I'm going to start with a fairly coarse uh, random orbit uh, disc and we'll try to get a uniform finish on that. For that process of putting the random orbit sander over that will give that a good key and help the powder coat to stick. Now uh, there's a fair bit of work in this so I'll do this off camera and I'll show you when I'm finished. Now my other Festool sander decided it didn't want to live any longer so I had to get out the Rotex. These are fantastic but man they're expensive. 
Now what I've done here is I've sanded both sides of this sheet to 150 grit. I've concentrated more on this surface here because it's the least damaged of the two. Now there is still a gouge mark in it just there. There's a longish sort of scratch somewhere else but I'm hoping when I process this I can get away with it. Now here's the one that I made previously. This was also scratched when I started and it's not too bad. Now the red areas that you can see are red powder coat obviously and the silvery areas are where the red powder coat has been etched off in my CO2 laser engraver. Then after that I've etched this with caustic soda or sodium hydroxide, this stuff here. Now it does a really good job of etching into the surface and if you leave it long enough it will actually totally dissolve a piece of aluminium. But I want to just use it to give a uniform etched finish on the surface and then it will be clear powder coated. So I'll go ahead now, uh, what I need to do first before I powder coat this is to drill a hole right in the very centre and that will be the centre of the clock shaft and also give me a registration position when we go into the laser engraver. I'm going to put a 3mm dowel pin in here to register this when it goes into the laser cutter engraver but I need to clean this now and get the red powder coat on. One of the challenges of powder coating is uh, how do you hold the part so you can get the powder on it and then not mess up that powder coated surface when you go to handle it and put it in the oven. So what I've got here is a big piece of aluminium sheet. It's earthed out to the powder coating unit. I've driven four long stainless steel screws into that and I can rest my aluminium part on top of those screw points. So I can powder coat this side. I can pick it up by these edges and flip it over. Now the material is oversized, it will be round when we're done, so it doesn't matter if I touch the edges. We'll flip it over to the other side and then we can get it in the oven. Now one of the reasons why I've used the long screws is that I can pick it up underneath like that and slide it into the oven without touching the part on top. I completely missed one of those screws there when I put that down. Uh, I'm not going to try and move it though. I think it's stable. It's sitting on at least three of the points. So I'll get this in the oven. See that? <laughs> Alright, I got that in. Now, I don't know if you caught it, but the first time I did this, I put it in the oven and I touched the back of the plate with the knuckle on my glove here and rubbed the powder off. So, took it back in next door, I put more powder on it, both sides, and I just repositioned it more carefully this time. So, give that about uh, 15 minutes and we'll see how it looks. You see that powder's fused now and starting to flow out. When that gets a gloss on it, we give it another 10 minutes and it's done. 
see how glossy that is now and it's time to come out and this is another point where you've got to be extremely careful <laughs> uh, because you can still mess it up if you touch it but also now it's hot so I'm going to try and slide this out very carefully and I put this down to cool I think you can see there what I was talking about with this piece of stock being bigger than the bed on my laser. So it's only 400 by 300. This is much bigger than that. So the piece of aluminium stock is going to have to overhang the fence at the top for it to work. And what I'll do now is I'm going to engrave the position of the center of the artwork, basically the center of the dial. And then we'll drill for a dowel pin and then we'll be able to put this back in place and do the engraving. So I've just engraved the absolute perimeter of the engraved area and also the center. So I'll get this drill for the dowel pin. All right, I've got the stock over the dowel pin here. I've made sure that the edges of the square stock are parallel and square to the frame of the laser engraver. That's going to be important later on. Now I've taped the stock down as well, just to make sure it doesn't move during the engraving process. Now we're doing a large area at 200 millimeters per second and there's a lot of acceleration and deceleration so you don't want things to move part way through. I've also run the engraving on the spoil board underneath just to make sure it's going to do what I hope it's going to do. All right, that took a long time, and as you can see, there's a lot of debris still on the surface there. I really want to give this a second pass just to burn off the last of the powder coat. It's quite heavy here and quite sticky. I think what happens is it tends to remelt the powder coat back onto the surface. If we give it a second pass, it should vaporize what's there. But when I did the test piece, I got the same result and it's actually easy to get it off with a scotch bright pad if you do two passes. Here's what it looks like after the second pass in the laser and it's got a lot of mess and dirt and sort of uh, burnt off powder coat on it but what I found is you can just sort of spray it with a bit of that um, what is that simple green and use one of those little magic sponges and that does go a fair way towards cleaning the aluminium. Now this is going to need a further step to make it look uniform. You can see it's quite dark over on this side here. I'll get off as much of this residue as I can, but then we're going to chemically etch this. But what I need to do next is to make this uh, square piece of aluminium circular. And I also need to mark the exact position of the 12 o'clock mark. And then this has got to go in the lathe. <laughs> now, like I said, this pushes the absolute limits of what I can do on the lathe as it's configured at the moment. I don't want to take the gap piece out. Uh, so we'll get this mounted on a piece of NBF and screw that to the faceplate. And then we'll look at turning the outside edge circular. And I also want to machine in a thing called a chapter ring, which is a, a sort of a circular ring that runs right around the outside of this logo here. Anyway, it'll become clear.
Right, that's our 12 o'clock position. Uh, I wanted to be able to do this before I make this into a circular blank. All right, this is going to be the finished diameter of the clock face at 330 millimeters. Alright, this gets bandsawn roughly to shape. I just enlarge that centre hole there to 6mm so we can mount this on the face plate more easily. And I need to remove the waste material off the corners now to make it roughly circular. Now I just checked and because of a miscalculation on my part I'm not going to be able to fit this in the lathe and have it swing over the bed without it touching. And I'm going to have to remove the gap piece from the bed of the lathe which I wanted to avoid doing. And I'll tell you a story about that later. <laughs> That's got rid of most of the waste. I did tape up the back of this just so I don't scratch it and uh, I'll take some more points off and then when it's roughly circular we'll mount it on the face plate. Okay this is 12mm MDF sheet. This is going to be the backing plate for the clock face while we machine the edge. These are just mounting holes for the faceplate. I'm going to drill and countersink for M6 screws. So there is the MDF disc screwed down to the faceplate and in the back I've got four T nuts in the T slots of the faceplate to hold everything. And I set this up while it was in the lathe and I had the tailstock in the 6mm hole in the centre here before I tighten up the screws. So our part finished clock face can go on that MDF disc. I'll put a 6mm screw in the centre there and a nut on the back. Tighten that up, but that's not enough to drive this. And what I need to do first is machine in the chapter ring. Now I just want to go just through the powder coat and expose the aluminium. And that, that chapter ring will have 12 hour positions marked and drilled in it. And when I've got those drilled holes, I can actually screw this to the MDF and then finish off this outer edge. But for the time being, for the first machining operation, we're going to have to just drive this with friction. I'll probably put some double-sided tape on the back of this just to give it that little bit of uh, friction to drive it. But I'm going to take you over the lathe now and look at why I need to remove the gap piece from the lathe and why it's going to be super annoying. Well, there's the faceplate and the disc on the lathe now, and you can see why I'm going to have a problem here now. When I measured this disc and set the size of the clock face uh, a long time ago, I measured the distance from the lathe center line to this corner of the bed down here and I thought oh, I've got tons of clearance, got at least six millimeters of clearance there but when I actually came to fit this I completely overlooked that this V on the back of the bed is higher and closer toward the center than this corner here. So when I go to rotate this now you can see that it just barely fits, in fact I can hear it touching in one place. 
So this gap piece is going to have to come out. Now I painted the lathe with this gap piece in place many years ago and it's actually got hardened paint across the join line between the end of the bed and the gap piece. So if I go to remove this I'm going to chip the paint or tear it off completely. So I'm going to have to do some work to cut through that paint layer there. But I'll tell you a funny story about gap pieces and lathes. A friend of my father's was a fitter and turner with a company called Evans Deacon in Brisbane. Now they were a shipbuilding company he worked in the machine shop and he told me a story one day about this style of lathe, the Colchester style of lathe. And he said that they had several where he worked and the machinists that worked on those would often be given a job that wouldn't actually swing over the bed of the lathe. And the foreman would just say, well, just remove the gap piece. And evidently these old school machinists would risk their job rather than remove the gap piece. They would just refuse to do it. The foreman would threaten them with the sack and I don't know what the outcome of the story was, but there you go. If you're an old school machinist, you could risk your job rather than take the gap piece out of your lathe. And their reasoning was that once you remove it, the lathe is never as accurate as it would be if it was left in its factory fitted position. However, I got no choice. Um, there's probably other ways around it, but uh, I'm just going to remove it. To mount the aluminium disc on the faceplate, I put double sided tape on the back of the disc and I put that over the top of the masking tape. Then I aligned everything using the six millimeter cap head screw, slid that through, and then I tapped down as hard as I could over the top of where that double sided tape would be. Now that seemed to grip, and it would have provided just enough drive to be able to machine off the powder coating. And I put it on the lathe, and it's a failure. <laughs> I'll show you. So I think you can see the problem there. There's some run out between the edge of the laser engraved image and the tip of the tool. Now that's unacceptable. I can't have that. So I'm going to have to rethink this. But I think the problem came back to the original artwork that I scanned and vectorized in Corel Draw. Now I just assumed that the image that I took was a, an accurate image, but it may have been scanned from a booklet or a document or something. And if it's not absolutely accurate, then it shows up when you get to this point here. Now I could sort of see it when I was doing the layers in Corel Draw. I had some accurate circles over the top of the scanned image, and I could tell that it wasn't quite right. Sort of forgot about it, and now it's come back to haunt me. Okay, I think I know how to fix it, and I'll get back to you. Well, there it is. That's as good as I can get it. Um, what I ended up doing was drilling the hole in the MDF backing plate to 9mm instead of 6 I put the bolt back in and sort of nipped everything up and put it back in the lathe and just tapped it in until I got it like that. Now the reality is that this edge that we're seeing going past the tip of the tool there is not truly circular. It's not offset, it's just not circular. So I'm going to end up using a very sharp uh, high speed steel tool and we're just going to cut that chapter in. I just wanted to be sure that the stripe that we see between the laser and gray part and the chapter ring is not obviously changing in thickness. Okay, this is a good look at the whole setup. Now, this is really a pressure turning operation. I can't rely on that double sided tape to provide a positive drive. So I put some blue masking tape around the edges here. And in the very center, I've got a cylinder of that composite plastic decking material that's been machined accurately on both faces. And backing up on that, I've got a piece of Delrin, and I've got a lot of tailstock pressure on there. And uh, we're only taking extremely light cuts here just to cut through the powder coat and maybe skim the surface of the aluminium. Alright, uh, that went fairly well. I did know that this plate is not going to be flat, so I'm going to have to go deeper until I get all of the powder coat off. So uh, we'll just keep at it. Okay, I think we're nearly there, uh, but the surface finish is terrible. I'm going to put a bigger nose radius on that tool, run it a little bit faster and see if we can get a better cut just to finish up on. Well it's better, it's still not brilliant. Um, I'll do one more pass uh, just off camera. I'm going to use some of this stuff as a lubricant. Uh, I don't really want to use a liquid uh, like uh, IPA or WD-40 uh, but I think this stuff will actually work but I'll do it off camera and I'll get back to you. 
Well, uh, that worked perfectly. Uh, what a shame I didn't have it on camera. Yeah, you could just tell uh, that it was cutting a lot more freely. Uh, so what I need to do now is to drill 12 holes in this patch where we've just machined it and they will be the hour markers. So this is how I'm going to drill the holes. Now I've got this old AEG drill set in a shop made fitting in the compound slide. I've got a 4mm spotting drill here. I've aligned the drill with the centre of the chapter ring uh, and also I've aligned it with the sharpie mark that I put on which showed where the 12 o'clock position will be. Now I've also got an indexing attachment on the back of the lathe that you can't see. Uh, I've shown it in previous videos but I can set anywhere between 1 and 36 holes uh, or any combination of that and I can go ahead now and drill the holes and then I can put a wood screw in one or more of the holes and that will lock the aluminium disc to the faceplate and then we can machine the outer edge. Now I've only put three screws in the 12 holes but that's enough to resist the torque from this last clean up operation. So we're just going to work on the circumference until we get a clean edge. Alright, that's it. I'm going to deburr that and then we can break this down. And the reason I didn't use a chamfer tool there is that the disc isn't perfectly flat and if I'd used a chamfer tool I'd get a, a variable width chamfer on it. Well, I've given that a bit of a clean up. I've taken the tape off the back and deburred the back as well. And I guess the next thing you're wondering is how do you put the numbers on it? <laughs> I didn't explain that, but this is how it's going to work. So I'm going to laser cut some clear acrylic uh, outriggers, I guess you call them, and then also some numbers in red acrylic, and they will sit on top and they'll be bonded together at a later stage. And then uh, I've drilled this hole out here to 5mm to show you how this works. So I've got some powder coated socket head cap screws. And I did all of these in one go uh, by powder coating them attached to this piece of aluminium. And they form the hour markers. So the way this will work is this clear acrylic piece will screw on from the back. And we can tighten that up. And you can imagine with 12 of these on the clock face now becomes much bigger. So that gets around the problem of, uh, you know, what can I actually engrave in my laser engraver? That, that was sort of the limiting factor for the size of the face of the clock. Now even with these outriggers and the numbers where they are now, it's still probably too small for this particular clock movement. And you see this minute hand is ridiculously large and it will need to be cut down short, uh, shorter. Now I think I can do that without damaging it. Uh, the hour hand is fine, so uh, you can imagine now we have all of our numbers uh, sort of arranged in a radial pattern around the outside edge. Now, um, I think I'm running out of time with today's video, so I'm going to finish up here now. Now, in the next episode, we're going to do all of the chemical etching, and that will give us a beautiful satin finish on the aluminium. We'll do the clear powder coat. We'll go ahead and do all of the laser engraved numbers, get the whole thing assembled, and uh, I can tell the time.
So that's it. Uh, thank you very much for watching today. I appreciate you uh, staying. It's probably quite a long video. <laughs> and uh, yeah, tune in next time. We'll get this, uh, this project finished and then we'll start something new. Okay, cheers, present. <laughs>